Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I have a daunting task today because somehow I have to link Greek mythology in with HIV testing, and you'll wonder how I can do that, and I will. So I realize, I recognize that I have a very diverse audience. I have some colleagues on the TV screen there at the back at various places, including my lab, I hope. I can't see them well. And, um, and from students to, to faculty and and so what I'm going to say um, is uh, we'll deal with some generalities, um, a little bit of, of data and generalities about, about um, uh, this thing that I'm calling a Tiresian metaphor. It's got nothing with tires or shucks, auto supply or okay tires. It's Tiresian. So who is Tiresias? Um, this will be familiar to some of the residents because when I'm doing classical virology with them, I actually discuss this prophet. Um, in the context of a metaphor for AIDS. But by background, um, Tiresias was a, was a priest of Zeus. And as a young man, he encountered two snakes um, mating. And he hit them with a stick. And he was transformed into a woman. And as a woman, um, Tiresias became a, a priestess and, and m married and had children, according to legend. And according to some uh, versions of the tale, um, Lady Tiresias was a prostitute of great renown. So after seven years as a woman, um, she found mating snakes again. And that's actually this picture here. You notice her breasts there. Um, so she struck the, the uh, snakes again and turned back into a man. Um, unfortunately, um, after that, she then stated that men enjoy sex more than women do. And she was struck blind by Hera, who is the sister slash wife of Zeus, for his, for his uh, anti-feminism. And he became a blind prophet um, who actually turned out to be a scapegoat in the poem, The Odyssey. So we're getting close. I'm not going to go into the metaphor issues with AIDS. I, I, the residents are aware of that. But I'm going to add on a little bit more here in the way of classical virology. And as you may or may not recall, um, Tiresias warned uh, Odysseus uh, and his men not to eat the cattle of the god Helios on their way back from uh, Troy to Ithaca. And uh, when Odysseus and his men landed on the island of um, Thrinacia, uh, they were starving. Um, Odysseus fortunately fell asleep, but his, um, and we woke up his men and eaten all the cattle. And as they departed the island, uh, Zeus you know, destroyed their boat with lightning and uh, killed all his men. And uh, the only survivor was Odysseus. Uh, he was saved because obviously he had uh, obeyed uh, inadvertently. Um, the wish of the gods. So the metaphor that I'm going to talk about today um, pertains to the serological diagnosis of HIV infection um, and where the release of uh, enzyme immunoassay results without confirmation is currently proscribed by the CDC. When I see CDC, think Zeus. Um, hence, uh, don't eat the meat, OK? However, <laughs> when using simple rapid tests, um, in the point of care setting, um, an unconfirmed reactive test can be released directly to the patient in the clinic. And this is a good thing. And there are various reasons for it, but getting this information back, even though it's a presumptive positive to a patient, um, initiates a, a, a dialogue with the patient about um, HIV infection or potential of it and avoiding transmission. But this particular rule hampers the uh, laboratory turnaround time uh, for releasing a presumptive HIV infection result to clinicians using our conventional um, either enzyme or chemiluminescence um, immunoassay uh, screening tests, which have to be followed by confirmation before we release the result. This generally raises the ire of our clinical colleagues for not providing the results more quickly, particularly when the patient is just about to be discharged from the hospital on the day the test is ordered. So my objective today is to provide some background and a resolution um, to this diagnostic Tiresian dilemma. I'm also dedicating this lecture to the young men of Delta Upsilon. This is probably the first lab medicine lecture ever dedicated to one of our Greek fraternities. Um, but uh, I, I won't say anything more about it because uh, I don't want to embarrass my son, who is a freshman <laughs> at this esteemed 
Greek uh, fraternity. Uh, so they need to know Greek too. All right. So the points I'd like to review today then, that in the United States, the current HIV diagnostic algorithm is based solely on serologic criteria for infection, and it's inadequate for the timely diagnosis of acute early HIV infection. That future diagnostic algorithms should embrace uh, simple rapid antibody and HIV nucleic acid testing to support our efforts to incorporate the concept of a presumptive HIV infection um, into our early reporting of HIV results. There's a, a clear need for it uh, from our clinical colleagues, and we're obliged to provide this service and can with the technology we have. Uh, and I will go into that um, shortly in some more detail. The simple rapid uh, test devices for detecting HIV infection um, will be very, are very useful for point of care testing in both resource rich and resource limited settings. Uh, and this no longer just applies to the developing world, but applies to many of our cities uh, under our dire economic um, conditions. But there are limitations to these tests, and we'll go over those, and they need to be appreciated. And there must be a greater effort made to educate healthcare providers, that means clinicians and laboratorians, about the utility of HIV diagnostic algorithms that incorporate these simple rapid HIV tests. Um, so I'm going to start with three clinical cases that illustrate some of the diagnostic issues um, that we're going to go into in a little more detail as we go through the talk this afternoon. And we challenge HIV diagnostics um, to the greatest extent when we look at uh, acute infection. Um, this is a period of time before there's a full antibody response to the virus. And as I've indicated, much of our routine screening for HIV depends on detecting antibody. So the first case, uh, called patient A, has unprotected anal intercourse uh, with patient B, who we'll discuss in a moment, um, three to four weeks ago, and then again prior, four days prior to presentation. Uh, has unprotected sex with other um, unshared partners uh, in the interim. And he presents with four days of evolving fever, night sweats, rash, headache, pharyngitis, cervical lymphadenopathy, diarrhea, fatigue, and myalgias. And he does not have Epstein Barr virus infection. He has HIV infection until proven otherwise. And fortunately, he came across astute clinicians that appreciated that because the vast majority don't. They would not have taken an adequate sexual history or risk history and possibly ascribed it to a viral illness like EBV. Um, they did an OraQuick rapid test, which is um, pretty common, and it was negative. Uh, and again, in the context of early infection, this isn't surprising. They were still entertaining the notion that it could be acute HIV infection. They appropriately ordered nucleic acid testing, and the test actually came back at 700,000 co RNA copies per mil of blood plasma. So that's that case. So negative rapid test, RNA positive in this uh, what we'll call a seroconversion window. Patient B is the partner of patient A. He's, has, he's asymptomatic. He's called in uh, because of his partner being uh, infected. He's asymptomatic. He's tested in our health department with a first generation um, enzyme immunoassay. It's negative. Um, he has plasma <coughs> put into a mini pool. Um, which is a process I'll talk about shortly that we do in conjunction with the health department to screen for individuals who are RNA positive, antibody negative. Uh, and they also did an unpooled um, uh, evaluation of his plasma, and it was negative for HIV RNA at that time. So um, he was counseled about that. That doesn't mean he couldn't have been infected. He may have been extremely early. Uh, and he was uh, counseled, and a week later, um, this is 11 days following his last sexual exposure to patient A. He uh, develops symptoms of acute HIV infection and comes back in. His unpooled plasma um, showed an RNA copy number of 621,000 copies per mil, and the CD4 count was extremely low, all compatible with an acute um, uh, infection syndrome. A week later, that's three weeks after his, uh, he acquired HIV, his, his EIA was still negative. Um, this, again, is a first-generation assay. Um, and uh, the RNA was over 2 million copies. So this is very compatible with an acute, acute infection. The last patient we'll discuss um, is patient C. He presents nine days after having unprotected uh, receptive anal intercourse 
uh, with partners of unknown HIV serial status. He presents with six days of symptoms. So they come on about three days or so after his exposure. Sore throat, diarrhea, and nasal congestion. And the lab tests at that time show that his EIA, uh, HIV-1-2, and Western blot are negative. Um, the unpooled HIV RNA was 923 copies per mil. CD4 count was over 1,000. And um, the clinicians looking at that result thought, well, maybe this is a false positive. It's off, off a low. Um, during acute infection, the RNA levels are very high, generally. So um, they thought this might be a false, false positive RNA test. They counseled him to avoid unprotected intercourse and asked for another round of testing. And he came back a week later. This is 15 days after his exposure. And his EIA is now positive. The Western blot is still negative. His RNA copy number is over 26 million. And the CD4 count has dropped to 336 cells per microliter. So this, again, is very compatible with um, um, uh, the, the part of the diversity we see with acute infection. So the take-home message is it's always important to recognize symptoms associated with acute infection because the majority of people who, be, who acquire infection become symptomatic within a 10-day or so period of time. This is work done by Tim Shacker when he was here as a fellow several years ago. Um, there's a continued need for risk assessment with pers of, for, of uh, individuals who seek counseling um, and testing. Uh, and uh, sometimes a single test at one, one visit doesn't suffice. Uh, and clinicians need to be aware of this. And um, patient A is, a, is an example of a simple rapid antibody test uh, being negative. <coughs> These simple rapid tests have general um, performance characteristics that are very similar to the um, uh, EIAs that we use for routine screening. But there are sensitivity issues that um, have been noted. And we'll refer back to patients B and C. Um, both the clinicians and the laboratorians need to understand the operating characteristics of these assays. Uh, and have a concept about this seronegative window, which we'll talk about shortly. Other points are that individuals may remain EI negative for several weeks following exposure. This is, was uh, illustrated by patient B. Seroconversion takes time, on average, about uh, between 20 and 30 days. Um, that's for reactive ELISA. Confirmatory Western blot can take a month or more, uh, maybe six weeks. Uh, false negatives uh, do occur if you catch patients very, very early in the seroconversion window before the RNA is actually uh, has risen to detectable levels. Unusual, but that it was illustrated by, by um, uh, one of our patients here. And false positives do occur. Um, the literature says anywhere from 2 to 5 percent, um, but it's, it's unusual given the current technologies that use sealed uh, uh, amplification detection tubes now. Um, and uh, has not been a problem for our lab. And generally, the range, uh, when you see very low levels, you, you're suspicious uh, when you're considering acute infection. However, we're, we're finding that uh, there are a fair number of people that, that do seroconvert subclinically and have very low RNA levels um, as, as we look more and more into this. But we definitely retest, as, as was done with that particular patient, and showed the rise in RNA. So an issue to discuss then is uh, briefly uh, is, is, uh, is the epidemiology of acute infection and implications of transmission. I want to talk about this for a moment because of our efforts with the health department and uh, Joanne Steckler and Matt um, uh, Golden and others, and Paul Swenson uh, in our division, uh, to, uh, to um, develop a pooling mechanism to look for RNA in, in HIV seronegative, uh, people who are screened and found to be ELISA negative but are at high risk and trying to pick up individuals who, who are in this uh, acute window phase of, of high viremia or viremia and no antibody. Um, the reason, and the reasons for this are a belief, it hasn't been proven yet, that, that individuals in this seronegative window may be at higher risk of transmission. And I'm going to show you some data looking at our genital fluid studies that, that tend to support that notion. Now, um, this is data from the World Health Organization. Um, um, indicating that in 2007, they had estimated around 46,000 new infections in the United States. CDC puts the estimate higher, maybe 60, 70,000 per year. It's been very constant over the last decade. And the question is, if we're treating, you know, over 90 percent of our people who, sh who, 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 require, who should be treated, um, then where's all this transmission coming from? Um, is it coming from, uh, you know, people with early infection or late infection? And we'll look at this issue. There's, there's a lot of um, circumstantial evidence from the epidemiologic literature suggesting 
that acute infection is likely important in sexual transmission. This comes from observational studies um, and models that stipulate that, that, that stipulate a transient early hyperinfectiousness, and I'll show you some data to support that. Um, half of the transmissions in a study in Rakai, Uganda, uh, occurred um, from newly infected uh, individuals. Uh, phylogenetic analysis from some of these studies show um, uh, 25 percent of incident cases are, are in geographic areas that cluster together uh, uh, with, with networking uh, transmission. And um, we know that acute um, HIV viremia is uniformly high in the magnitude of genital shedding, uh, is, that it's observed in acute infection, is sufficient over the first two months of infection to, to support this hyper, uh, or intense hyperinfectiousness. And so this particular uh, graph um, shows the, uh, the relationship between the transmission per thousand coital acts <coughs> on, the, on the ordinate and on the abscissa, um, three phases of HIV. Uh, the month, uh, months following uh, the index partner seroconversion, you can see the incident um, index partners, um, the, the transmission per coital act is very high and then drops off over the first couple of months and um, remains rather low uh, and then goes up in the later stages of disease as um, immune control is lost and the viral levels rise. In our own studies done with, um, with uh, Joanne Steckler, uh, we've looked at um, uh, the s levels of HIV in the semen from acute um, men who have undergone acute infection. And uh, these are data from 83 men sampled multiple times um, following presentation in an acute infection study that's been going on uh, in the virology division for, for an, a number of years now, started by Tim Shacker um, uh, over about 15 years, 14 years ago, I guess. <coughs> and what this, these data show is that um, the blood level, which is shown here, this is the mean level in blood, and then semen, they're very similar. There's about a half a log difference between the two, with the semen being generally about a half a log lower. They both um, uh, fall from a peak to a plateau that occurs around three months um, in both, both compartments. The blue box in the bottom um, indicates the viral levels below 3.8 logs per mil of seminal plasma. And this is the threshold below which we don't get in, we can't re recover infectious virus from the semen. And above that we do, which suggests that there may be an infectious threshold uh, in the, around the four log area. Um, that if you're above that, you have a higher risk of transmission than if you're below it, based on infectivity. These um, are the data analyzed a little differently for the same 83 men, showing <coughs> the relationship between seminal plasma HIV RNA level, uh, again on the ordinate and uh, months following acquisition, HIV acquisition on the abscissa, um, with data clustered at, at monthly intervals. And again, the threshold is shown at 3.8 logs. And um, uh, cultivable virus above that. Uh, and on the top, the proportion of men who, who in each of the, at each of the months who have viral RNA levels above this threshold. And you can see that in the first two months, um, it, the hi highest proportion of men uh, with, with virus in that level are, uh, exist. And it tends to drop over time as shown by the drop in the median, which is the red bars. So that first two month period um, coincides with the modeling that's been done indicating high levels of, of virus in the semen during that two month period of time. As immune control or containment of the virus occurs, uh, the viral levels uh, drop in the semen and infectivity drops accordingly too, we, we postulate. Uh, again, this has not been rigorously studied in in prospective trials yet. Um, as you can imagine, sampling uh, the general compartment frequently enough is a difficult task, and I'll, I'll save that for another Grand Rounds and how we do that <laughs> for you men so you can relax. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a modeling data uh, coming from the um, UNC group, Mike Cohn, showing the relationship between the probability of transmission per coital act, unprotected coital act, again on the abscissa and, and weeks after infection on the ordinate, showing that men in the, in the upper quartile, 75th percentile, or upper quartile, um, had about a tenfold, um, upper quartile of RNA level in the plasma, had about a tenfold increase 
um, risk of transmission um, uh, compared to men in the lower quartile of, of this. And you can surmise then that, that with concurrent, and this drops within the first couple of months or so uh, as immune containment occurs and then rises later in the disease. But, but in this interim, this plateau period here, um, with concurrent STIs, sexually transmitted infections and the like, um, one would expect peaks uh, in, uh, in genital virus load and therefore potentially um, more infectivity. And there are studies going on here at the university and with Larry and Anna Wald and, and Connie Kellum and others looking and, and, um, and uh, Gerard um, uh, uh, Beaton looking at um, uh, the relationship between these levels of virus um, in the general tract, um, concurrent herpes reactivation uh, and, and transmission. Um, because one would like to link uh, the, the relation, uh, nail down the relationship between the levels of virus in general tract and actual transmission done in these population studies. Uh, a difficult task, but one that's bearing fruit. So, I've mentioned seronegative window, what is it and how to close it. So to start to look at the window, um, let's look at the genital mucosal surface. And here's a cartoon version um, showing the uh, cervix of a woman at the transition zone between stratified squamous epithelia and this columnar epithelium of the endocervical canal. And as you know, the, this extends onto the surface, the uh, vaginal surface of the um, cervix is known as the ectropion. And therefore, an area that can be traumatized uh, by sexual intercourse, it undergoes metaplastic change um, as part of the uh, involution of it and is a potential source for entry of virus. When HIV gets across this mucosal surface, uh, it can establish a local infection in the submucosum, uh, which may or may not take off. Um, uh, a term that, that viral eclipse period, when the virus is replicating there, before it gets to the lymph nodes. Now, generally, this may occur within a few days. In some individuals, it may take much longer. But once the virus makes it to the lymph node, the regional lymph node, um, uh, it begins to replicate. Containment of the virus in the submucosum is due to innate immunity. Um, and and uh, there's a large, there's a study going on with Tofu Zhu and others looking, and, and Julie um, Malkarath looking at exposed seronegatives to try to understand uh, what the relationship is between virus and, and this particular compartment. But when the virus gets to the lymph node and infects T cells there, um, then it disseminates. And from that point on, the, 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 the points of the seroconversion curve are pretty predictable. And so I summarize it in this cartoon that shows um, exposure this eclipse period, um, which generally is quite short, but in, in, in maybe actually some weeks in, in, in a few individuals, uh, reaches a lymph node where replication ensues, and then uh, this programmed sequence of events. Um, during the first 20 days or so, there's no detectable antibody. Um, current assays may detect it within a few days, but on, on average, um, uh, it may be 20 days. RNA then uh, is detectable first, and then uh, later uh, antigen, uh, viral DNA in cells, and then the antibody response starts. So although the EIA may be reactive by day 20, um, confirmation with Western immunoblot, in other words, we look for specific HIV-associated antibodies, uh, that may take another month or so. So during that period of time, we may not have a confirmed Western blot, but a conf uh, an indeterminate Western blot. And this whole process has been studied very closely by, by Michael Bush and his colleagues at University of uh, California, San Francisco. And they've come up with this scheme um, that's probably only known to laboratorians called the FIBIG um, um, uh, stage of infection. <coughs> uh, and, and this goes from stage one to stage six with full-blown seroconversion in stage six, stage five uh, with um, uh, EIA reactivity. Um, and a confirmed Western blot, which generally takes um, about a, um, a month to two or three months. But I wanted to show you that the sensitive third generation, fourth generation, third generation assays, generally people um, uh, are starting to seroconvert uh, by that assay in about three days or so, or about seven, 10 to 17 days after infection, an average of about 13 days. An indeterminate Western blot appears about um, 
five days later, which is about 20 days into the, into the, uh, into the infection, and um, then much later, full stroke conversion. So we're left with individuals in here who are definitely RNA positive during this period of time, pick up uh, P24 antigen um, about a, a week later, uh, and then go on to seroconversion. And the one that people are interested in are in here where we don't have a serologic confirmation or even necessary detection of infection, even though there's lots of virus there. And this is the group that uh, p some people believe are, are hypertransmitters of virus. But that remains to be proven. Uh, but we have now tools to, to look at this, this particular group. So five big um, stages. And uh, what I've done here um, if you all look in the right panel, this is the window period reduction going from first generation assays. Uh, and as I indicated until recently, our health department used a first generation assay, and now a third generation assay. Uh, third generation assays um, uh, detect both IgM and IgG and have peptide and antigen um, uh, components to the assay. Fourth generation assays detect both free um, P24 antigen from the virus as well as IgM and IgG antibody. Uh, they decrease by another five days, and then RNA, or nucleic acid testing, shortens at another three days. So, um, and, and it's very s comparable between nucleic acid testing and P24 detection. We don't have fourth generation a a um, EIA assays in this country. Um, the companies that produce them have never um, asked for FDA licensure. <laughs> They've used them extensively internationally, and in fact, for over a decade, many other countries have been screening. Uh, you're looking for antigen and antibody, and the United States has actually been behind the, get the ball for a long time, um, <clears throat> uh, probably because we have a bigger bureaucracy, and decisions about how to advance testing is a much slower process here. And so some of the, my comments are going to be directed at this issue of, um, of, of looking at different ways of trying to, to assess infection and, and what we need to do. So, um, Plasma RNA. It's the only way we're going to narrow that window down and pick up people in this in, who are seronegative but clearly infected um, with HIV virus. There's now approved, uh, RNA testing is now approved for clinical diagnosis of HIV infection uh, and has a very important role to play in acute uh, infection. Um, there are occasional false positives. Um, this is rare uh, but can occur and again uh, we are concerned about that with, with low levels in the face, low RNA levels in the face of, of apparent uh, acute infection. And there are obviously um, social and legal ramifications of a false positive test. Um, they, it should be confirmed uh, with either antigen or, or DNA or follow-up testing to show a rise uh, in, in either RNA or um, establishment of, of, the, of the antibody response to infection. Uh, false positives occur um, rarely, um, but are a consideration. And um, uh, it's important to know that, uh, as you know, the, the blood supply is screened for HIV, and these data from 2000 showed that uh, only 4 of 12 million uh, units that were antigen, P24 antigen negative and antibody negative, in fact, had detectable levels of HIV RNA. None of those obviously made it into the blood supply, but that's uh, about one in three million, so pretty, pretty, pretty safe blood supply uh, from an HIV point of view. There are um, at least five quantitative um, RNA assays that are available in the United States as of this year, and I've listed them here. Uh, the uh, Amplicor assay by Roche has been a workhorse assay that's actually being re replaced in the next year or so. They're going to stop manufacturing it. And it's going to be replaced by a real-time PCR amplification platform called uh, Ampliprep TACMAN. I'll come back to that in a moment. The Nucleosense uh, assay uh, by B.O. Miriu is also FDA approved, not really used very much in this country, used um, internationally. Uh, the BDNA assay by Siemens um, is around. Uh, we used to use that assay uh, before we replaced it with our in-house real-time PCR assay about um, nine years ago, but it's still in use and again also has a, a fan base um, internationally. The two commercial assays that are available uh, in this country that are real-time PCR platforms are the um, uh, Roche 
Ampliprep TACMAN version 1 assay and the Abbott M2000 system. We actually converted over to the Abbott system uh, in July because um, of its ability to detect non-clade bees. And uh, we also um, were evaluating the Roche assay at the time. The version 1 assay has major problem detecting some clade bees as well as non-clade bees in rec circulating recombinant forms. So th because of that, actually, the, the company has put in version 2 this year to the FDA for approval. And it's a different assay. Um, the version 1 uh, detects uh, the target is in GAG, uh, and there are clearly mutations going on in GAG. We've even seen that with our own assay, our own in-house assay. And so they've expanded it to detect both uh, target and LTR, long terminal repeat of the virus, as well as GAG. The Abbott assay actually uses integrase as its target, which has turned out to be quite stable and, and, and very, very good. So um, not only do, are we using it, but also our international uh, clinical trials group is also using the M2000 platform now. Um, so it's going to serve us well into over the next several years. Um, so with, with that having, sa having said that about the platforms, then as I mentioned, one of the things that we're doing with the health department is, is this issue of pooling um, and looking at seronegative pools from the screening program in the county to see if we can identify um, acute HIV infection. This is work going on with and Joanne Steckler and Matt Golden and, and others. And what we have actually developed is a, is a matrix, <coughs> um, which is a, a way of taking 27 uh, individual samples, putting them into a single pool, and then putting them into uh, sub-pools, uh, nine of them, each tube in the, of that nine representing uh, one of each of three rows, three columns, and the three levels or boxes, uh, if you like which defines in space a three-dimensional uh, uh, description for each single specimen so that if the pool, the whole pool of 27 samples is positive for RNA, then we simply go to those nine tubes and sample each tube. And, the, and we can identify up to three samples that are positive, which would be very rare, in that collection of nine tubes and provide a presumptive positive to the um, health department and then can go back, have them go back and pull the individual plasma sample from that, that patient or patients and we retest it as a single unit. So we're able to actually turn around in two PCR cycles and identify an individual in a pool of 27. Um, and we're, you know, which is turning out to be very, very, uh, uh, provide an expedited um, um, answer to the health department so that if they're going to intervene uh, with this individual who's in acutely infected, they can do so within a couple of days of get us getting the sample. Um, another uh, area um, where RNA is very um, important um, is uh, are in, in subjects who uh, are vaccinees They're, uh, of, of HIV vaccines. And um, we, did, we've we did a study um, uh, with the HIV vaccine trial network looking at 733 subjects <coughs> who had been enrolled in 15 phase one or two vaccine trials and had completed them by March of 2006. And we evaluated, them to evaluated these subjects to distinguish those um, who had a vaccine-induced HIV seropositivity, which is, what one of the which is what the vaccine does, versus true infection. And what we found of the 733 individuals looked at, that about half of them had reactive EIAs. And of these reactive EIAs, about 15% actually had a positive Western blot according to CDC criteria, the positivity arising from the vaccine-induced antibody. But if had they been tested in the community and they didn't bother to tell the, the, the lab or the person testing them that they were a vaccinee, they would be called positive, infected even though they weren't. And we confirmed that they were all RNA negative. Um, so the issue is that, that to sort out um, the true infection status of individuals who, who have an antibody profile compatible with HIV infection according to current serologic criteria, and if it, they've had a vaccine, that we need to use nucleic acid as part of that routine algorithm to sort them out. And that's exactly what we do um, in, in, and based on, on this approach. So that's another area for RNA testing. Um, and you can see that, that one of the potential avenues then um, is, is to develop a rapid point of care RNA tests that could be used to confirm infection or rule it out 
in such individuals, providing they're not on therapy. If they were on therapy and had the viral RNA suppressed, of course, a negative RNA test wouldn't necessarily help you. But none of these people um, were known to be infected, and, w and some of them actually got were called infected based on the serologic profile because they had their testing done outside the trial. So there are complications around, around the serologic changes associated with vaccines. So let's for a moment then look at the simple rapid antibody tests and how we can improve turnaround time. This is the Tiresian meat dilemma that I talked about earlier and what our approach has been to this. Now the CDC came out with the revised laboratory criteria for case definitions of HIV infection <coughs> a year ago um, in December, to actually now two years ago. And they stated that a positive result from an HIV antibody screening test, that means a reactive uh, enzyme immunoassay, but uh, although they didn't state it, it could also be a, a reactive chemiluminescence immunoassay. Um, uh, if it's confirmed by a positive result from a supplemental test, which is a Western blot or indirect immunofluorescence, um, they don't yet qualify RNA in there, nucleic acid testing yet, um, or just a, a nucleic acid test that's reactive or a P24 antigen that's reactive and neutralized or recovery of virus by culture, which is hardly ever done. That this would serve as a uh, case definition of infection, but it does not um, replace the current HIV screening uh, requirement, which is to use um, uh, not to use virolo uh, virologic tests or non-antibody tests alone, um, that you still uh, you can you can't replace antibody testing with these um, other direct markers of virus yet. Now many other countries do, and uh, we're not there yet. Um, these are ongoing discussions that the CDC is having and trying to come up with a tailored and I think more modern approach to diagnosing HIV. Nevertheless, that's the dilemma that we're in, um, um, having our hands tied and wanting to produce um, a, a more rapid turnaround time uh, with a presumptive diagnosis or presumptive HIV infection to help guide clinical management. So by a quick review, um, I've mentioned third generation assays. These are recombinant antigen peptide sandwich assays, detect IgM and IgG. Also in this group are the chemiluminescent immunoassays, and as you know, um, these platforms are, are, are supplanting uh, the more traditional EIAs um, and are in wide, wide use. The fourth generation assays, not available in this country, but they are outside the country. They've been available in Canada and Australia and Europe for over a decade and are very useful because they detect free antigen uh, and antibody, so um, theoretically can pick up people who are viremic with antigen levels uh, and, uh, that are detectable, and that means the RNA levels are over 10,000 copies per mil during this acute seronegative window period. And both the third and, and fourth generation assays have greater sensitivity than the earlier um, uh, second generation assays uh, or first generation assays. Uh, and it's a point worth knowing because many health departments are still back in the first and second generation EIA assay uh, era. It's hard to believe, but it's, it's true. So there is an opportunity then to combine the e, uh, third generation EIA, which is what we use, with a simple rapid test um, to come up with this presumptive positive approach. And um, the, the, the part of the impetus for this uh, comes from um, recent changes in, in, in the CDC, uh, CDC's recommendation to do more screening, to try to identify the quarter million or so people who are HIV infected but don't know it. Um, and as a consequence, there's been a push to getting more point-of-care testing done uh, in the clinics and, and other areas where high-risk individuals may congregate. And um, uh, point-of-care testing is, is, is an approach that's been taken. Now, um, most of you are, almost all of you are probably familiar with point-of-care tests um, and some of the HIV ones. There are uh, six uh, FDA-approved um, simple rapid uh, test devices or a quick uh, Unigold being quite common and, clear, and, and Clearview tests, they're all clear waved and suitable for point of care. Uh, the others are considered of moderate complexity and therefore are used in laboratory setting and that's what we use is the multi-spot HIV-1-2 rapid test. Now these tests um, have three formats, immunoconcentration, um, which is the multi-spot, it's a flow-through device, immunochromatography, which is your quick, and particle agglutination, uh, which is latex agglutination. 
uh, was seen with the other assays. The uh, CLIA uh, wave test is shown here, Unigold and Clearview and the Oroquic. Uh, the multi-spot is shown up on the top, shaded, and is the assay that we use. Now these simple rapid tests, um, a number of advantages, they increase um, the, the receipt of test results to patients because they get the re test results while they're at the clinic. It's been shown that about a third of people never come back for their test results in STD high-risk clinics. So uh, engaging them in conversation about their serial status, be it reactive or negative on the test, is useful um, and um, uh, is considered important to public health measure intervention. Um, the object is to increase H the detection of HIV-infected pregnant women so that they can receive effective prophylaxis at the time of labor and delivery. One of the most important therapeutic interventions ever in the HIV field has been the um, introduction of uh, or blocking of mother-child transmission by treating the mother at the time of delivery with antivirals and, and, and prophylaxing the baby for the first uh, several weeks of life. It's cut transmission down from 20 to 30 percent to less than 1 percent. <coughs> uh, but you need to identify these high-risk women at the time of labor and delivery when they may not have been tested. You can identify them and begin the process of, of um, prophylaxis for the baby and, and treating the mother. Um, I've mentioned about acute care settings and providing the same-day results. Uh, rapid point of care tests or simple rapid tests also allow you to, um, to do testing outside of clinics. You can do it in pharmacies, you can do it uh, in community, community gatherings, wherever, different venues, uh, and try to, to bathhouses, wherever, and try to get to the high-risk individuals and screen them. The downside is with low serial prevalence, um, you're going to get false positives. That's just the way it goes with any screening assay, nothing new. Um, but that's fine because you're going to do confirmatory testing. But you've now engaged the individual in conversation uh, about the potential they could be infected. Clearly, point of care tests, simple rapid tests, are inefficient for large scale screening. Right? They're just not set up for that. That's what we want to use the ELISA platforms or chemiluminescent platforms for. But um, for small numbers and, and, location, and, and certain locations, they're, they're efficient um, for that. Quality assurance is extremely important, and I'll show some data in a moment about that. Um, quality assurance uh, raises certain questions and issues when you go to non-laboratory based testing uh, and uh, have healthcare providers doing the testing when they're pulled six different ways to Sunday doing other things. To have them sit around for 10 minutes and wait for the test to develop is actually nonsensical uh, and causes all sorts of problems. These are just data from a labor and delivery study showing um, here the point of care test result turnaround time very short, done, done at labor and delivery, and when it went to the lab, coffee break, lunch, other things happened in here. Now, now we know we can do better than that. This is not the University of Washington, this is another institution. So we would never see data like this from our institution because we really believe in offering these services in stat labs with trained personnel and free up the clinicians to do what clinicians do and use our laboratory uh, personnel to do the testing. But very effective, I think, as I mentioned, for labor and delivery, and I won't belabor it, uh, it's important for therapeutic intervention. Um, so <clears throat> how have we approached our Tiresian dilemma? And so um, between July 31st, 2008, and October 8th, 2009, um, my lab screened over 13, almost 14,000 uh, samples for HIV as part of routine clinical testing. And of these, there were 1.5% were, were EIA reactive and confirmed by Western blot. Um, 203 uh, were EIA positive, Western blot positive, and multi-spot positive for HIV-1. 39 were EIA reactive, Western blot negative, and 33 indeterminate in 6, and all were multi-spot negative. And there were two EIAs that were HIV-1 positive, but the peptide for HIV-2 was reactive and subsequent uh, Western blotting in, in confirmed that it was HIV-2 infection. So of, over this period of time, of our positives, 1% are HIV-2. And I mention this because HIV-2 is, I think, grossly underappreciated in the United States. People generally don't look for it, uh, seriously. Uh, and if you don't look for it, I guess it's not here, right? But 1% 
uh, the population here, there's HIV-2. So it's something we really uh, believe we should be looking for much more carefully and was one of the reasons that we chose the multi-spot because it allowed us to do that and pick up these individuals. And uh, there are therapeutic implications for being HIV-2 infected. Now our goal here was that for turnaround time. So um, here's a full report with confirmed Western blot. Um, uh, turnaround time is about three days interquartile range because there's holidays and weekends and things like that. And then here's our turnaround time with the multi-spot. So we take the ELISA, if the ELISA is reactive, we run in the multi-spot right then and there. And within a few 20 minutes, we have a result back to the clinician indicating either negative or reactive. And so far, all of our reactive um, ELISAs and um, reactive multi-spot for type 1 have confirmed by Western blot. We've had no false positives. And so this is now being incorporated as a routine testing to, to get this, test, this t turnaround time to within the same day. <clears throat> and I think that obviates the need then for um, point of care testing on site, like people were talking about doing point of care testing in the hospital ward. Can you imagine what it would be like if you have people running around doing the, you know, nurses doing the testing while they're checking out the patients in the morning and stuff? It would be just terrible. We'd have all sorts of bad, bad results. So we think we now have, using our standard AEI screening, uh, which is robotic and allows high throughput to do, to do this presumptive, um, identify presumptive infection uh, right away for the clinician and, and, and give them this additional information. Um, so this is a, a, an algorithm that we're, we're pushing. So um, simple rapid tests, uh, what are the limitations? Well, um, in a, a, a model performance evaluation that was done by CDC, uh, testing 528 sites that use uh, rapid tests, 8% um, uh, reported using serum and or frozen plasma um, types for the OraQuick uh, test. And unfortunately, it wasn't FDA approved for that, uh, that analyte. Um, 6% of the sites only used EIA for confirmation of a preliminary positive, and the CDC recommends that they do confirmatory um, Western blot. And there's a real value to having ongoing um, external quality assurance with this testing at these multiple sites, because many of these are not, they're not labs, they're clinical sites that's doing the testing as part of their routine clinical practice. And as a consequence of this, um, uh, a couple uh, last year, there were reports of a lot of false positive um, or a quick um, test. This is the uh, the expected number and confidence band for for false positive, and it was big, there were big peaks, and these were probably associated with training problems with the clinical personnel uh, doing it. So um, uh, I can't stress the importance of, of of external quality control and assurance in this whole process of how one. Um, um, looks for these problems uh, at the testing sites. And again, as you know, we have a very active point of care QA program here in trying to set up our rapid testing so that we um, d uh, are able to put the burden of testing on the lab but have the lab respond for, for quick turnaround time. So um, in conclusion, it's important to recognize the symptoms associated with acute infection um, because the majority of people do present this way with symptoms. Um, many clinicians miss them. Um, there's a continued need for risk assessment for people um, who are seeking HIV testing, and both clinicians and laboratorians need to understand the operating characteristic of these, these assays that are available uh, and be able to proffer advice to the clinician about doing repeat testing, what type of testing they might be able, they might be required to do to sort out whether the individual is infected. And there's going to be a larger dependence on the use of nucleic acid testing to do this and a need to develop a rapid uh, RNA uh, <coughs> tests that can be used um, for this purpose, again, to improve the turnaround time. Um, individuals may be initially negative by rapid testing and remain EIA negative um, for quite a period of time. Again, repeat testing and the suspicion of HIV infection is very important. And I think sometimes clinicians benefit from reassurance in the lab that yes, they, they need to do some more testing to sort out the problem. 
False negatives do occur, um, uh, and usually that's because because of um, the, the individuals are caught too early in the in the uh, ser in the con in the infection cycle to actually have high enough levels to pick up. Uh, the assays are set up with internal controls to really tell you that you've had you've had recovery of specimen and amplification, um, and that it's not a technical issue. False positives occur rarely, um, but we think about them with low RNA levels uh, when we're thinking about acute infection. And when we expand uh, testing into low seroprevalence populations um, and low risk individuals, uh, you have to be cautious. Um, and I've already alluded to the issue of low risk HIV-1 vaccinees uh, and, and then this, and the requirement there to actually look for nucleic acid because the antibody profile following vaccination can mimic uh, and meet the criteria for a confirmed um, uh, HIV antibody uh, reactivity. So the points we reviewed today then is that in the United States the current ser serologic algorithm is inadequate um, uh, for a timely diagnosis of acute early infection. We need nucleic acid testing incorporated into that. We have this program uh, with the health department to try to identify these individuals. We believe that we can produce a presumptive HIV infection result for a clinician based on a combination of third generation ELISA and a simple rapid um, test such as multi-spot. It also allows us importantly to look for HIV-2 which is among us and is underappreciated. Um, that um, these tests are very useful for point of care testing in both resource risk, rich and resource limited settings and resource limited settings are no longer just the purview <coughs> of the developing world. Um, this impacts our own healthcare system uh, as we speak. There are limitations to testing and clinicians should be aware of these. We need to make a greater effort then to educate uh, providers and, uh, and laboratorians about these HIV diagnostic algorithms uh, and how to incorporate them uh, these test devices um, in, into current diagnostic practice as well as move towards developing rapid, simple rapid nucleic acid testing uh, which we can use for confirmation. I'd like to specifically acknowledge um, my, my laboratory uh, and all their hard work and uh, Joan Dragovan and, and colleagues uh, Joanne Steckler, Paul Swenson, Matt Golden, uh, Christine Cooper of the HVTN and my assistant Julie Spiritus for her um, encouragement in developing the Tiresian theme. Funding and CIFAR. And so take that, Zeus, I ate the meat. Okay, thank you very much. They're all antibody. The, qu the question is, are there point of care tests for nucleic acids? No, those are under development uh, now. Um, many of them um, are, are going to have sort of a quantitative or semi-quantitative characteristic to them. Um, and we're actually about to begin uh, work with a particular company that's got a very nice test in place. We're most interested in getting the um, point of care uh, rapid uh, RNA tests out and evaluated in the field at international sites too. Um, so I think a year from now we'll actually have data. Yeah, it, um, data from, for, for local sites? Or for local. We're going to do local first and then, and then international. I mean, is that, is that, um, is it reasonable to, to, to hope that that sort of testing can be, can be used in these resource for uh, locations? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Nice uh, overview. Uh, I, we talked a lot about the um, increased risk of transmission and uh, acute infection. Mm -hmm. Is there also a potential benefit for very early treatment for the patients who are infected? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, if you identify individuals who are early in infection, like acute infection, is there benefit to treatment? Well, who knows? Uh, you know, um, 
randomized controlled studies haven't been done, um, but studies have been done, and generally um, those individuals seem to have um, uh, uh, more, more preservation of the immune system. But quite frankly, um, till the proper studies are done, we don't know, and it's actually hard to believe that we still haven't got an answer to that question because it's so important. But, um, you know, HIV therapeutics is, has been subjected to a lot of, of the belief system over time. People believe things, and the virus cons consistently um, outsmarts us. So eventually we may know, but at the moment we don't. Hey, Bob, you talked about the concentration of um, virus in semen that's mm -hmm. important for What is the infectious dose that's needed to infect with a blood transfusion? Is that well understood? So the question is, what's the infectious dose to um, transmit the virus by blood. Oh, I, I, I don't know the infectious dose. I mean, I can tell you that the risk is about 10,000 times what it is by sexual transfer of virus. Because the cases where the virus has been transmitted by blood, generally they were highly viremic individuals. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But the risk is obviously much higher. Not only because there's more virus, but also the, when there's a blood transfusion or blood exposure, there's usually a, a larger volume involved. <laughs>